Welcome to Our College, Your Voices. I'm your host, Kara Monroe. We have talked about the Ivy Tech student success commitments in at least three previous episodes. If you have been on any of our campuses, you are seeing these commitments displayed on green posters and signs in our hallways, classrooms, and offices. Some of us even have wallet cards in our uh, phone cases and wallets. But we are trying to do more than just put up signs. We are really trying to find ways to make these commitments come alive through real activities and actions. Today, we are going to talk with three of our campus deans who are making specific efforts to work with their faculty to create a climate of student success in their classrooms and in their interactions with our students. And I am excited to introduce you to our panel. First up is Alicia Spray. Hi, Alicia. Hi, Kara. I'm uh, Dean of Art Sciences and Education in Lafayette. Wonderful. Welcome. And next is Martin Wolfker. Hi, Martin. Hi, Kara. I'm Dean of Art Sciences and Education uh, in Bloomington. Welcome. And Robert York. Good morning, Robert. Good morning. I'm Dean of Art Sciences and Education at the Sellersburg campus. Excellent. Welcome. And uh, back for, we think his fifth time, is Dr. Russ Baker. Hi, Russ. Good morning. Russ Baker, Vice President for Academic Affairs and System Office. Very good. And Russ, um, I'm going to ask you to sort of start. This effort grew out of uh, a wig, a wildly important goal here in systems office. Can you talk a little bit about sort of how this originated? Sure. Well, as you know, uh, you were in the room when we convened all of the people in systems office, academic affairs. Um, I believe there were probably around 15 of us in the room, maybe last September. <laughs> and we gathered to tr really try to figure out what we were going to come up with in terms of wildly important goals that would be relevant for uh, us in our work in systems office. And particularly, we were looking at the challenge of how can we impact student success when we don't directly have responsibility for campuses and the instruction that goes on there. So ultimately, we ended up with three different areas of goals um, that we kind of agreed. We did a simplex type process, you know, we had dots on the board and all of that. And we ended up kind of uh, agreeing that empathy in the classroom, innovation in the classroom, and then what we ended up calling uncomfortable learning were the three areas that mm -hmm. we were going to try to coalesce around. And, and then we divided our group into which of those three you wanted to work with. And I ended up being part of the group that was looking at empathy in the classroom. And so to make a what could be a very long answer shorter, <laughs> Um, we ended up deciding as a group, there were five of us, I think, that we were going to figure out a way to make the student success commitments, which were at that time just being developed and, and thought about, we were going to find a way to use that as the basis for our work. So I'll leave it at that for right now, but that's how this first got started. And ultimately, we decided, let's find out how many faculty would be willing, willing to formally sign on to those commitments. And that's what we did. Um, seven campuses ended up saying, um, through their art, science, and education deans, that they would be willing to be part of this kind of pilot. And they were, in addition to the three campuses represented by Martin, Alicia, and Robert, we also had Lake County, Terre Haute, Evansville, and Lawrenceburg. So seven campuses in all that were part of this. And we can dig deeper into how we did that if you want to, but that's that's kind of the big picture. And I think some of that will come out today as we talk about that. So for each of the three of you, um, why did you decide to become a part of this initiative and sort of what what has that meant on your campus? Highly aware of the normal patterns of faculty on my campus. I was, I felt most self-assured that if we participated um, in the empathy wig, that we would most certainly have a very good response. I gathered that, you know, once we surveyed further uh, where our faculty were headed with the commitments that it would affirm a lot of practices that they were already performing uh, in their classrooms anyway. Picking up on what Robert was saying, these 
Faculty supports for student success are really just part of quality teaching, engaged teaching. They're, they're not unusual, but bringing them forward is a good reminder for our experienced teachers to come back to it and for our new teachers to start. For Lafayette, it was a matter of we, we are very fortunate that we have a large number of faculty, both full-time and adjunct, and we teach in every methodology uh, modality, I should say, so that we, you know, we could get an idea of how effective this is and maybe help to contribute to some ways to examples to show how we are effective in bringing this to the students. I'd like to just echo everything Robert and Alicia just said. Um, what was really appealing to me, in addition to what was mentioned, is the anonymity of responses. When the faculty commitments were first introduced to our faculty, it was done in uh, large all-faculty meetings. And the feedback we received was really positive. And it was, uh, like Robert said, most of our faculty said, well, this, these are things that we're already doing. It just kind of reaffirmed what they do in the classroom. Um, but I felt anonymity had a, a tremendous advantage because sometimes in big meetings, there's faculty who don't feel comfortable speaking up, especially if they disagree with the majority. So the anonymity aspect was really appealing to me. And I was quite pleased when uh, Dr. Baker shared the results with us because it really reaffirmed that even faculty members who didn't necessarily speak up during the meetings were on board with the, with the, committee, uh, with the commitments. And Kara, if I can just go one level deeper, each of the deans from the seven campuses ended up finding out how many of their, again, this was only full-time faculty in the School of Arts, Sciences, and Education. So that was the control group. Uh, they then said yes or no, I, I'm going to affirm that I will keep these commitments on a survey. But the deans don't know, even to this day, which of their faculty necessarily said yes and which said no. All they, all they have is the, the aggregate total mm -hmm. for their campus. And we thought that was really important because we didn't want this to feel like another way that we were kind of checking up on the faculty member or that it would be part of their evaluation somehow that why did you not respond to the commitments? We didn't want it to be like that. Right. So I, I, I think that's a further explanation of what Martin's talking about when he says this was anonymous. Mm -hmm. We do know how many total faculty responded to the survey across the system. We know how many of those said yes, but we don't know any individual identification within that. And one point that at least Robert and Alicia, and I think the anonymity aspect brings it out to Martin is that we asked in that survey having, cause I get to see all the good surveys in this job. Um, we asked sort of what one area of the commitments would you like to focus on and, and really grow. And I, I think Alicia, you said, these are really just all elements of good teaching we all know as educators, we can always get better. So how have you seen that working on your campuses? You chose to take part, you've chosen, your you, many of your faculty have chosen, it's a very high percentage of faculty on the aggregate that have said yes to this. Have you seen any effects already this current semester? Well, well I'll go first and, and I might start out in a different direction. I'll talk about Please. myself a little bit okay. because I taught a class last semester in the fall and intro to psychology course and the um, commitments really were at the forefront of my thinking and I'll be the first to admit that there were two that's that really stuck out for me the first one is learning students names early in the semester and I'll be the first to admit that I have a horrible memory for names I get lost and I cannot remember names so I tried to devise a strategy that would help. I've, I've tried different things in the past. And the second part that stuck out to me was the early intervention piece. You know, right from the beginning, make sure that faculty, uh, that students, sorry, know who to go to, know who to contact if they run to, into problems. So I added a graded assignment to my syllabus that simply required students to set up an appointment with me during the first two weeks of classes. And it was really informal. They could meet with me before class, after class, in my office, over lunch, and it was their time. I told them they could use the, this time uh, any way they wanted to. For some students, it was a 15-minute meeting. Everything went well. We talked about maybe our personal backgrounds a little bit, and that was fine. Mm -hmm. I always emphasize, though, to everybody that Ivy Tech is unique because we do have an open-door policy 
And if students need help, as long as they ask for help, we can assist them. Some meetings were more intricate and longer. My longest one took about an hour and a half, and it allowed me to help a student effectively change her degree, change her enrollment status, work with financial aid to make sure everything was okay, and introduce her to a program chair. And I think that's what makes that's our fantastic. college unique. Yeah, Because I can fantastic. take a student and just walk her uh, over to the financial aid office to make sure that she doesn't incur any additional costs when she switches a degree. I'll pick up on part of what Martin was talking about, the learning of names. We know our students are individuals. We respect them as individuals, but it helps when you use their name uh, that they know you're seeing them as individuals. Mm -hmm. And whether it's when you're coming to get them for an appointment that you say, hi, Jason, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Thanks for being on time. Or that was a great conversation, Anita, that, you know, mm -hmm. that, let's follow up on that, that they know that you know who they are. And, and this, I'll uh, is a point that I'll, I'll use that follows up on actually last month's podcast about what to do in online classes. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, I've gotten a lot of feedback from my online instructors about how do you implement ones that are so personal right. in, in a less than personal situation, mm -hmm. which is what online teaching can be at times. So really using the IV advising tools already mm -hmm. in place, that they're just using what we already have. Right. It's not reinventing the wheel. It's just using it in a more thoughtful and consistent manner. So they're mm -hmm. finding they are getting more feedback from students. Students are responding more as far as Canvas or Ivy Learn goes, that they're using not only the comments on assignments, but discussion boards. Uh, some of them are using the Google Hangouts we already have. Mm -hmm. So they're making more and thinking more thoughtfully about how to use the tools we have. And that seems to be making an impact on both sides of the equation for the students and for the faculty to feel more engaged with their students. Great. To follow my colleagues, uh, I too would like to draw from personal experience. Uh, I commonly teach IVYT 111, and I make it a point early on to meet with each of the students for half an hour as we're working on the first assignment, which is academic planning. And for that, um, I will make discoveries during those 30 minute conferences that I hold with each student, looking at their closely at their record, at their audit, making sure that they're aware how to go through my Ivy and find all the necessary resources early on in their career. And I will often make discoveries uh, within their records that prompt me to pick up the phone, send an email, or walk the student to one of the other offices. Mm -hmm. We will find some, I, I'll you know, decide an example. We might find where the student has stated, since I've met the student, uh, to be in a certain major, and I will open up the audit the first time, and that student will not be in that major. Mm -hmm. And I will say, are you aware that you're not in that major? And then we will, you know, take the walk to the advisor or the registrar, make sure everybody's available, and proactively seek correction to that. So when the commitments came forth, and I would see an example such as monitoring uh, student behavior and progress or know your campus resources and direct students to them, you know, that's just something that's sort of in my DNA. I'm, I'm a fan, as, as my colleagues here know, I'm a fan of the minutiae. <laughs> and, the, and the fine details, <laughs> yep. or as our colleague Russ often says, I get in the weeds pretty deeply. <laughs> and uh, that's just really part of the job. I think that uh, to, to now know that there's something more overt that our faculty members at our various campuses um, have as, as somewhat of a lead for their own, again, practices that they already perform, but also something that prompts them further into deeper activities. And I think, conscientious. I, I think the point of this was intentionality. Mm -hmm. um, again, like Robert and the others have, have said, these weren't things that we weren't already doing and that our faculty weren't already doing. Right. But having them more top of mind makes all of us, I think, be more intentional. Mm -hmm. And doing things that we were already doing, but more on an episodic basis, now we are able to plan uh, and that we do that a little more intentionally. I think that's really what mm -hmm. the student commitments for the faculty and staff mm -hmm. side is trying to accomplish. I know you have talked about something you're doing just as you walk Dr. Kara mm -hmm. back and forth to the parking lot. Right. Um, and that is not looking at your phone, but looking for ways you can engage with students. Mm -hmm. uh, I've tended to follow you on that and am trying to do that same mm -hmm. thing. And as a result of that, there's been, you know, two or three really interesting interchanges that I've had with students. 
I think those kinds of specific anecdotes are happening all across the campus, and I think they're happening more often because we're being reminded of the need to do that through the commitments. And if I can add on to that, um, while we are the dean's sassy, sorry, school, art sciences education, <laughs> and we are sassy, you'll, if you didn't know that already, you'll, you'll learn that, um, but that these are our colleagues in the other schools too, and it's not mm-hmm. just the posters in the hallways and in the classrooms, but that they're sharing their stories and their experiences about things that they're implementing and the student response to that. And so I think if the students are getting it more consistently in all the classes they do with Ivy Tech instead of just one they do with Robert or one they may do with the math faculty at Sellersburg, if they get that more consistently everywhere, then it becomes uplifting in its entirety. And I want to add something to a comment that Russ made about the intentionality. I think the the culture change that needs to occur in this institution is really it, it, it's really related to the in, intentionality part. Mm-hmm. Because the commitments are something that faculty have been following, I think, for a very long time, but they may not have been intentional about it. Mm-hmm. So I was really pleased to see uh, after we did the survey, after we talked about the commitments, we have a faculty-driven professional development magazine. And in the latest edition, there were two articles written by faculty that referred to the faculty commitments, that referred to faculty mm-hmm. engagement with students. Did also refer to a culture shift where faculty are now also responsible for uh, recruiting students for their programs and getting them excited about what it is that we offer. Very good. So, uh, Martin, that's a good segue into the next question I'd like to talk about, which is you don't know who's participating in this. You know some of your faculty are. You also know, as as you've made such good points, that this is a college-wide effort. You're doing things specifically and intentionally in your uh, school, but the other schools are doing this well as well. What strategies are being employed or are you specifically employing on your campus in your team meetings or in individual conversations to try to keep this alive? And I know you've already talked some personally, but I'd like to dig more into that. I think a lot of uh, faculty took at face value the commitment to um, interact with students by name the first class or in the mm-hmm. first week. And of course, most take role. Uh, but from there, many, I think, were initially apprehensive about, can I learn all those names in such a hurry? And I, I think that was maybe missing the point where the intentionality of faculty working within the commitments uh, prompts them toward more deliberate uh, sense of learning Uh, who their students are. This is a culture shift for our students and for our faculty, and that not that they weren't already doing this, but it's getting more used to it, more comfortable Mm -hmm. with it, having it feel less forced to use people's names. I don't think the students expect us to be perfect. I don't think they take it the wrong way if we don't get names right. I think they appreciate the humanity Mm -hmm. uh, of our efforts in that uh, having a sense of humor goes a long way on both sides. So I I think it's just a slow encompassing of that. And while we don't know how many were in the original pilot, uh, I do believe very positively that um, seeing your colleagues doing this, hearing stories about it, hearing from their students about what other teachers are doing, are slowly bringing others along who may not have found a comfortable way to integrate it just yet or to integrate the commitments fully yet. And if I could circle back to, again, the wig that was driving this in Mm -hmm. system office, which was about empathy in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And Kara, one of the things you'll recall that we heard early on when we started talking about student success commitments was that last year's um, SGA presidents commented that in at least a couple of cases, and and this is going to sound a little on the negative side, but they had specifically been in some classrooms where faculty had said, I think this is a small number, Mm -hmm. but some faculty had said, "Um, I'm not going to try to learn your names. That's not something that I'm good at. And just so you know, I won't be trying to do that. I think that first of all, by, by focusing on these commitments, we've sent the message that You may struggle with names, as Martin already has said he does. I'm finding the older I get, I do Mm -hmm. as well. Um, But when a faculty member gets up and says, you know, I may struggle with your name, I may get it wrong, I may mispronounce Mm -hmm. it, but I'm going to try. That sends such a much more positive message to our students. And I think 
again, we're overusing the term, but the intentionality of that and sending the message that as a faculty member, this may not be something that you feel like you're gifted in, but at least let the students know you're going to give it an effort. I think that's um, that's really been, as you said, Alicia, a bit of a culture change for us. Um, one of the things I like is that now I've actually, when I was asking for feedback from my my full time and my adjuncts who are doing this, you know, what stories do you have to share with me that would be helpful to me? They're like, well, we're doing this now. We need more, mm-hmm. uh, and some of it is that through the conversations with students, they're finding out that not all our students are technologically savvy or comfortable or have the equipment, so they don't know how to do things that before they kept their head down on. And so now they're like, well, we need more videos to help train this, or we need more accessibility to that. So we're getting some windows on things we hadn't seen before that were problems, and if we can be responsive to those, the students will feel the the impact, I think, towards their own success that much greater. To follow up on, on what Russ said earlier, I think it took me about till week 13 or 14 to <laughs> remember every student's name. And right. I was really upfront about that right? because it's just something I, I have I struggle with. With the commitments, I think I managed to learn all the names by week three, which I think is a great success for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so what we also did in Bloomington was that we provide schedule activities that are focused on the faculty commitments. And it goes back to uh, the weeks. We also have wildly important goals in academic affairs in Bloomington. And it was really important for us that uh, the academic leadership does not dictate what faculty want to do in terms of engaging their students and maybe assisting with enrollment management. So we put a faculty task force together that developed weeks for our academic affairs in Bloomington. And one of the things that we've done and that's centered on the faculty commitments is that we have regularly scheduled faculty luncheons where we open up Shreve Hall. And it's typically during points of the semester where big assignments are coming up, where students start to struggle, where we allow students to just stop by and have lunch with faculty and have conversations outside of the classroom. And we invite full-time faculty and adjunct faculty members uh, to these luncheons. And I think that's crucial because we have a much easier time communicating with our full-time faculty. And it's very helpful to provide adjuncts with schedule activities Mm -hmm. where they can um, engage in some of these faculty commitments. Knowing that you all were doing this, I knew which seven campuses were doing it. And as President Elsperm and I have gone around on the President Provost Tour, I will just tell you that when we get to the slide where we talk about the commitments on your three campuses, I've seen a difference in the conversation we have. So on your campuses, I immediately knew that you were leading this effort because your faculty just jumped right in with with comments and ideas. So kudos to you all and to your faculty for the work that they're doing because well, it shows. I was going to say the heavy lifting is being done by the Absolutely. faculty. They are the heroes in this. Yep. So if it's a success, it's because of them and the way they've embraced it. Absolutely. I'd like to bounce off of that too. Our campus has more recently been attuned to, if not specifically the commitments, its own wig led by our vice chancellor, Catherine Sherrard. Big shout out to Catherine Sherrard. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's smiling, Catherine. (laughs) But we, among uh, wildly important goals that we're dedicating ourselves to on our campus is a move toward retention within our programs. So from that, uh, I was able to pull together art sciences and education faculty. And never did I begin to talk about this without making reference to uh, the wig that Russ and his group had initiated, where we are working toward a modest percentage increase in retention from fall to fall. And from that, uh, I assembled a small wig committee on our campus, all of, all of whom uh, contributed great ideas for us now as fuller group of faculty to follow in, in terms of uh, systems knowledge, reach out to each and every uh, assigned general studies adv- advisee as we still hold a faculty advisor role, mm-hmm. and to be intentional uh, when those students whom we have as advisees also happen to be within our classrooms to make those full mm-hmm. circle connections with the students uh, so they know us not only as their teachers, but also as, for lack of a better word, and a word that's been used in the college, mentors. Mm-hmm. So that's something that has been very intentional that ties directly in. And I, and I found, I think your wig had a little head start on our wig, but they kind of coalesced 
uh, mm -hmm. in January on our campus for, for this group of faculty. And I know we, we are talking about the faculty and the faculty support of the student commitments, but for, I'm sure in all our areas, part of that, the faculty's ability to do it well and interact with students also comes down to the staff, the way they're greeted in the office, the way they're directed to the right resource mm -hmm. or helped at that moment, if that's something right. the office can do. So I, I just see it as an integrated partnership, I know, for my school and I believe for my campus. Absolutely. And Elise, you um, said it so well that our faculty are the heroes in this, that they are doing, we're asking them to do just a little bit more and to grow a bit each semester with the commitments. What stories are you all hearing from individual faculty members about the way the commitments are changing their class or their activities? I think they're feeling more engaged. I think it's a little early yet to see what the result is for the students, because as we were talking before, this is a culture change. It's not enough in one class. Hopefully you save a student who may have been thinking about dropping or withdrawing or disappearing or whatever word you want to use. And they've decided because they feel they have a commitment from the teacher or a relationship with the teacher that they're going to stick with it. Right. But it's a little early for us to see what the impact is. But for the teachers, I, I believe that they are feeling empowered by it, strengthened, um, finding that dedication again in the teaching, not that they've lost it, but it's one of those things that constantly needs to be just reinforced that these are the good things that teachers can do. It's a natural for them. So, I think what I've been hearing goes back to the intentionality. Again, it's faculty saying those are things that I've done for a long time, but I'm thinking more about engaging with students so I've heard faculty tell me that they've made it a practice that after the first class meeting, when they get back to the office, they sit down and they write an email to all students, just thanking them for being there, for being mm -hmm. active, for being engaged, for listening. And they do that then throughout the semester. So when they're in their office hours and um, they don't have any students that they're advising, they might go on my Ivy or Ivy mm -hmm. Learn and then um, just write a short message to students, course-related, non-course-related, it really doesn't matter. It's just keeping that constant contact to students. Uh, reaching out, I've heard that as well, reaching out after class to a, a student who made uh, a particular challenging comment maybe during class to let him or her know that, that that's greatly appreciated and that that, that, that takes quite a bit of courage. Uh, so it's the little things that I hear more of and the word that I hear mostly is that intentionality that Russ mentioned earlier. I'd add to that if I could. Um, a little bit more deliberate outreach after that mm -hmm. first quiz or exam may not have been stellar uh, mm -hmm. to the student to give them support, to find out what resources they need, not to let it just disappear and say, next time I'll be better or let the student deal with it on their own. So I think that's helping as a support mechanism too. Okay. It's, it's fairly easy for general education faculty in particular to feel perhaps less of a kinship with program, that is general studies program, liberal arts program, even though they're faculty within those programs, they're also faculty serving all. And so they've got such a broad uh, swath of, of students to work with. And what I'm finding this semester with the intentionality behind uh, the wig is that that fifth, uh, item among the commitments, knowing the resources on campus has been one that has drawn um, more of the faculty at Sellersburg toward uh, learning about the other offices, knowing where to guide a student, where it might have been less common for them to do so because they probably have far less interaction with advising, with express enrollment in the other offices. But now I, I feel that some whom have you know, talk to me about the commitments have have found that that's that's really a necessity in the in the role uh, is to be holistic, and that's really intriguing, Robert, because that was the one of the five commitments items that the by far the fewest faculty said they were going to focus on, and I think it might have been because it was the last on the list and they'd already checked the box <laughs> right. before they got there. But it also was maybe the one that felt the most outside of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. But the fact that that you're seeing that on your campus and there's uh, there's a real effort to do that is is really encouraging because again, that's the the area where maybe uh, faculty are saying I already do these things, but on that one maybe not so much. And if there's an effort to do that, I think that's really encouraging. Mm -hmm. I think if you get more comfortable with the first four, the fifth one becomes something that flows from the others. It becomes a natural extension. 
What would you like to see the college consider beyond this semester to try to keep the commitments at the forefront of our thinking? You know, this is not a new initiative. It's a it's a culture shift, as, as you've said so many times today. How do we keep the momentum on the culture shift? In an institution as large as ours, I think this is always challenging, but wherever we can generate forums uh, for uh, faculty to come together, and again, I'm about to borrow a cliche here, but to present best practices in light of the five commitments. As they've rolled out and have become official, um, we're certain you know, to have them reinforced in various you know, contexts anyway. So you know, examples might be you know, space within curriculum meetings, certainly uh, as we continue each year with the uh, Student Success Summit, that there could be perhaps a breakout on commitments mm-hmm. and, and ways in which faculty have that open forum to be able mm-hmm. to share. I know often that, you know, people will feel, oh, well, I, I wish I could do that or I'm already doing that. But uh, I think that that would actually give voice to what, you know, once on, you know, we move from the abstract list mm-hmm. to the actual voices of practice. Following up on what Robert said, and I agree, best practices, we need to share them in formal, formal settings. One of the things I've done with the stories I've collected in feedback to my, what tell me what's going on, good or bad, just so we can do it, is putting it together, taking names off of it, um, but putting it together and sharing it with the deans for them to share with their faculty that, you know, if and when we're ready, what that can go out just generally to the faculty. We could certainly build something into uh, Canvas Ivy Learn. Mm-hmm as a a platform for that. I would say, and I don't want to overburden our new effort with growth mindset, but this is a natural extension of that. I mean, just without putting too much weight on one or the other, that you have to implement growth mindset exactly in what you're doing, but reinforcing with students about capacity, ability, that um, there are support systems for you. It's a natural. So I would think in a lot of ways that goes next. And I think in light of that, that growth mindset is something that could equally be applied to all of us mm-hmm. yes, and all absolutely. of the faculty. That is, some of these commitments, again, as we, we've stated, make intentional that which perhaps was going on anyway, but to be even further you know, intentional is to you know, examine one's own potential toward uh, advancement and change. Absolutely. If we had a word cloud for today, Kara, it would clearly be intentional with the <laughs> biggest <laughs> it would. word. On the t-shirt. And, and, <laughs> I think I think that really does capture, though, um, the goal here is to make intentional and more common practices that we were doing before, but without as much strategic thought behind them. So th- there were clearly some great ideas that Robert and Alicia and Russ um, already mentioned. There are two things that I think we need to do to keep this initiative going. One is clearly a strategic outreach to adjunct faculty. And that's because, especially in our school, we have turnover in adjuncts. We have sometimes the majority of courses taught in a particular Mm -hmm. discipline taught Mm -hmm. by part-time faculty members. Mm -hmm. And they come in and they're not necessarily aware of the culture of Ivy Tech, of the faculty commitments. So we need to be really strategic when, when they come in, they need to be exposed to the faculty commitments. We've done that this semester by adding the faculty commitments to our adjunct faculty orientation. And that's going to be crucially important for Ivy Tech as a system. Yes. The other area I think where we need to really focus, that we really need to focus on is online education. Because it's somewhat unique in that there are not many opportunities right now to have synchronous contact with students. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe the college needs to consider that at some point in time to have opportunities for faculty to meet with students one-on-one in real time to get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, And then the last point I wanted to make is, uh, and that's maybe not related to the faculty commitments, but to the student commitments. I think they're also crucially important because I, as as in any good relationship, you know, if you want to keep it going, both parties need to make a commitment. We need to make sure that faculty commit to student success, but we also need to make sure as a college that students commit to their own success. So that's something I think we need to focus on. I'd I'd like to follow that. On the Sellersburg campus, our eight-week champions have been the catalyst for breaking out into groups, um, staff meeting with eight-week champions, faculty meeting with eight-week champions. And 
part of that, I believe, um, makes more clear and overt among all factions. Even our Ivy Life director has uh, directed students toward being aware of the student commitments in an, in an event early on this semester. So there are plenty of examples where I think all three levels of commitments are being pursued by the different factions, and we're all becoming aware of all of the, the faculty, as Martin and, and Robert mentioned, can't be doing the heavy lifting by themselves. That as long as they become more aware of the outreach efforts to the students uh, and that they can see it with their students themselves, that hopefully there are some ways the students can express this more and more, that I, I think the integration will work. So as we always do with every episode, we end with a call to action, and I have a few of them for you today. If you have a suggestion for how we can maintain momentum for the student success commitments as we move into our summer term and then on into next year, please send them our way. I will give you all of the details of how to reach out to us in just a minute. And also, if you're doing something personally on your campus or on your campus that is related to the student success commitments, or you have specific examples of how these commitments have made a difference in your interactions with students, again, please send them our way. Uh, We'll all benefit from hearing them and publicizing them, as the group has said today. Thank you again for joining this episode of Our College, Your Voices. I want to thank the members of today's panel, Russ and Martin and Alicia and Robert. It was so good to have this conversation with you guys and to listen into it. You didn't need me very much today. And that was, <laughs> it makes for the most fun conversation. I'm your host, Kara Monroe. You can connect with me on Twitter at KNM Tweets. Our producer is Ann Penny Valentine. Ann is on Twitter at Indie Penny. Russ Baker was again the guest producer for this episode. Russ, thank you again for all the work to put this together. You can reach us by email at our college, your voices at ivytech.edu. And you can send an email in a couple of different ways. You can just send us a regular text email. And if it's something for a show, we'll be happy to read it in for the for you on a future episode. You can also record a voice memo with your computer or with your phone and attach that to the email and send it in. And we would be we would love to include your voice on the show. You can also just leave us a voicemail at 317 317- Five seven two five zero four nine. Again, that number is three one seven five seven two five zero four nine. And we can actually use recordings of voicemails as parts of the show in the future. Russ has actually used that number while driving in his truck before because we read it slowly now. So our website is ivytech.edu forward slash podcast, and it is maintained by the amazing Tracy Allen. Production assistance for this and every episode are provided by Becky Campbell, Sarah DeWitt, and the Ivy Tech Community College marketing team. And our podcast concept is by Matthew Pittman. Theme music, recording, and post-production services to remove all of the trucks and thunder that's going by provided by the amazing Jen Eads at the Brassy Broadcasting Company. We will see you next time on Our College, Your Voices.